Hey, folks, just a friendly reminder that all shows on the Madness Comic Network are produced by their individual hosts and in no way reflect the opinions of the network as a whole. The statements in the following broadcast are not necessarily the opinions of the Madness Comic Network, its staff, sponsors, or contributors. This show is rated TVMA, as are all of them and all those other letters, Viewer discretion is highly advised, and, you know, just do what Doc says. Read that again. Peace, everybody. The final frontier. It has never been so uncertain as now. AI, VR, haptic wear, nanotechnology, mass destruction with a remote click. Now we are finally seeing the true potential and dangers of an ever-connected and overly policed hyper-technological world. Have we finally become the architect of our own demise? Is there still hope? Welcome to the future. Welcome to Punk Droid. Hey, my Dirk Manning here, the writer and creator of numerous comic books and graphic novels, including Nightmare World, Tales of Mystery, Brave But Not Dead, uh, all kinds of stuff. And I am super excited for you because you are getting to watch right now Right this moment, out of all the things we're going to be doing, you're getting to enjoy and revel in the Madness Comic Network. And that is awesome. Thank you for being here. Howdy, howdy. We are live, folks. And uh, <clears throat> welcome to the Comic Artist Hour. I am Les Garner, 30-year uh, veteran of comics, animation, and all kinds of crazy crap. So... Uh, and joining me here today is my buddy, Charles Moissant. Hi. 
publisher of a variety of different comics, writer and uh, publisher of comics and games. So yes. we're doing doing a number of things together. Yes. But right now it is time for the Comic Artist Hour. And uh, this will be the, I guess this is episode two, first, is, first episode, I said, almost said issue. First episode was sort of a, a bit of a dry run. So this time around, uh, we're going to be going more towards, uh, I guess, what uh, what I'm thinking of as a regular sort of theme for the show. Mm-hmm. And that is an ongoing analysis of what makes comics great and the, the art, how that art's done, why certain art works, why certain people are considered great. And, uh, you know, we'll be analyzing a lot of this stuff. Uh, some some shows will end up doing some live sketching and things like that. We're planning on doing some guests. Uh, there's a whole variety of things that we're going to be doing. So, But for today, I've pulled together a handful of pages from old John Bashima work, and mostly Conan, although I think I've got um, a piece with M- M- Mephisto from uh, Marvel in it. And so what we were going to get into is mostly talking about, uh, you know, composition and how the page is laid out, um, how that plays into, you know, the quality of the page, what, how successful it is, all that kind of stuff. So um, I'm going to kick things off. Like I said, I've got these things loaded up here. So this first page is, is from an older Conan. I'm going to say this is probably late, late sixties, early seventies, excuse me. And, uh, I'm looking at this right now thinking about, you know, what, what makes this page work? What is, what is strong about this page? Uh, I I don't want to be hypercritical, especially of, of certain, you know, of, of older artists who are so foundational to what we do. Um, for myself, this type of layout that he's he's got going here is uh it's not one that oh let me kill that stuff it's n- like i i personally was never a big fan of a three-tiered layout so if i'm going here here and here i was never a big fan of that and there's a, a, a principle that I'll get into as to why. So most of the time when laying out a comic book page, there's a, a, a principle, I call it the Z principle. So, and of course it's going to be inverted if you're looking at manga. And that's really the only difference in this principle. But when you're reading from, you know, from left to right, you need that page to consistently fall in a Z-shaped pattern with the artwork. Now, there's lots of different ways that you can get into that. And when I talk about composition, that's going to be a lot of what I'm gearing towards is how we get your eye to go from up here across to some center of interest down to whatever is over here and off the page because you want to lead the eye across, down, and over so that you are thinking, or so that without thinking, rather, you're able to to know that your viewer is going to want to turn that page. So, Charles, you see anything on this page that you would do, that you would have done differently or anything you you would offer a critique to? And I know this is this is John Bashima, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm probably going to rankle some feathers with it, but no, no, no. The the the, uh, the one thing that I'm analyzing from from a different point of view is the writing, and also uh, doing a, a reverse uh, pathology of how the script may have been written. But one of the rules that uh, they seem to adhere to is the uh, 25 word count panels. If it's a normal six panel book, you should not have more than 25 words per panel. For example, panel one, 21 words. Panel two. Mm-hmm which is a long panel, uh, is a word, panel three, 15 words, panel four, three words, panel five, seven words, so on and so forth. 
And that's another thing that one has to also pay attention is the composition of the uh, characters and figures. For example, panel one, you have room at the top, which is more than enough room for their speaking lines. Uh, you know, had you uh, changed the angle uh, or used more close-ups, uh, you'd be interrupting the art. You know, for example, let's say that you had close-ups similar to panel four, Conan tossing the uh, the ring or the coin or whatever that is. Uh, you know, if there wasn't any room, you could really disrupt the art. So uh, that's it, just one thing that that I, that I tend to pay attention to when it comes to uh, writing comics and even trying to create uh, descriptive breakdowns for the uh, potential artist. Nice. Yeah, that is definitely something for people to think about. Now, a lot of that is uh, plays into the uh, uh, what is kind of a, an age old debate in comics of the uh, Marvel style versus the DC style of writing. Mm -hmm. And I, as an artist, I really like to work from the Marvel style. Mm -hmm. that's uh, cool. But but that's I mean because I'm also a writer. Yeah. And, and that's the thing is like, not every artist is a good writer and not every writer has a good artistic eye or a good sense of the craft of the art that goes in. That's one of the things in, that makes comics so unique and weird sometimes and difficult is that as an art form, if you have, the typical comics, you know, going to be made by a, by a creative team, you know, writer, penciler, inker, letterer, colorist, so on. And that team has to collaborate properly. And the first point of contact in that collaboration is between the writer and the artist or the, the penciler typically. So, you know, the writer, I've, I've looked at scripts from people before where, It'll say page one, panel one, and I'm thinking that panel one is basically a book from Tolstoy. Ha! And I'm like, uh, you realize there's no room here for art because of how many words are in this. So, you know, that's that's a that's no bueno. That's not cool. Yeah. So uh, you know, and that's kind of a kind of a thing that I would point out. That's actually a good good thing to think about here. Uh, a good note to. Uh, uh, to writers who might be watching this is, you know, get, get in mind a general word count that you can allow for. And it's just a rule of thumb, obviously. And then the other thing that I would really, really suggest writers pay a lot. Well, writers and artists both pay a ton of attention to is the principle of show. Don't tell. Correct. Because the more that you can show in the visual medium, the less you have to say with words. And the less you have to say with words, the more space you are able to allocate in the case that words are actually needed for something. So, you know, it's it's there's a, a process, I think, that you can go through of whittling down and prioritizing the content that's going to go on the page. So, you know, that's, it's actually a great point that Charles brought up and I'm, I'm, yeah, that's a, that's a very important thing that I'll probably uh, come back to. I'd, I'd say we'll come back to that as we go through these other pages, because I've got, I don't know if we'll get through all of these pages I've, I've got loaded up, but we'll, uh, we'll uh, be looking through, through a few more of them. So I, I just, to jump in real quick, I also okay. sent, uh, if, if you want to show that a little later, uh, one of the pieces we're working on, and we've done that the Marvel style, where I gave a overall arc of the story. And what you've done with the layout is allow for a lot more, uh, a lot more room for text and exposition, because it's an origin story and building up and it's narration heavy. And I, I found it fascinating that you were very conscious of that fact with uh, the current story that we're working on uh, with one of the uh, pieces. So it, it's, it's interesting. Um, when a writer, you know, when writer writes the DC way, where it's very strict panel one, ABC, panel two, uh, that is also very good for the artists who are creative technically, 
but not creative imaginatively. Yeah. And what I mean by that is uh, there was artists I worked on with where they could not think of anything. But if you told them what to do, amazing technical pieces would come out. And, and that also, uh, you have to be mindful of that. And, I, and as a publisher, I try to uh, put together writer artist teams and I work to keep them together so they develop synergy and understanding and you know beautiful work can, can come out. You know, for example, on the piece that you showed, who is the uh, writer? I am not sure. I, I really was looking only for uh forgive for me John Bashima's work. I mean I, I, I can't can't recall who it is. Being that it's old Conan, it very well might have been Roy Thomas. Right. So, you know, let, you know, but, so, you know, let, you know if it was right, Thomas, I'd say so, the last time with the relationship, but I'll, I'll back, back up from that. And the thing also, which I find fascinating too, is this older work, everything is in my hand. There is no computers involved, no digital work involved. Uh, if any machines were involved, it would be Xerox. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 definitely a, a huge difference. I mean, that's kind of the world that I think that's a world you and I both came up come came up in. Um, I mean, for me, that world was on its way out when I first started in comics. I I I, I got my first uh, first work in comics back in ninety late or early ninety three. That's so awesome. So, that's uh, so awesome. Yeah, actually, it was late late ninety three, late ninety three. Oh, and. Cool. Uh, just to interrupt, uh, uh, one of the uh, participants asked if we could zoom in on individual panels temporarily as you go through this. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Which uh, that's something I was I was about to do because I want to talk about the layers of composition in a page. So, like this page, that's one of the one of the things that makes a comic book page so such a unique thing in the world of art. Because most pieces of artwork, you have a, you know, you have typically a square, a rectangle, you have some shape and an image. And that's that. It is the image is the image is the image. With a painting, it's that way. You know, you, know, you can talk about sculpture and things like that as, you know, it, it, as, as having more to it because of the way that you can travel around it, see from different angles. But it's still a single subject. Whereas a comic book page, by its nature, unless it's a splash page, you know, a comic book page, sequential art, by its nature, is multiple images displayed together. And those images need to flow from one to the other. And just as I was saying with the, you know, the whole, the, the Z phenomenon that happens in, in reading a page... Well, inside a panel, this is probably going to pixelate a little bit, but that's okay. Inside a panel, you know, if we have, like here you can see the lettering for this just plays right across the top. So that allows this to stay pretty simple. But sometimes you'll hit, end up having something like this panel. So this lettering, if, we, if we're looking only at this panel, it starts here. We come across and then down, and then something has to pull us back out through. And if we look, we've got okay. We know where we begin to read read is going to be a contact point for the eye. Okay. Then as we read across, this is repeated. This 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 uh, this direction is repeated with the arms, and then the thrust of her body helps lead us down to the next to the next point of interest being those the the lettering right there then we have a foreground element here that helps pull us out and another element right here that pulls us right on through so that that right there is a, a masterfully created panel that interacts with its writing incredibly well and the letterer has chosen now. If you think about this, the letterer on this could have chosen to put this entire block of text over here. Yep. And 
I would argue that they could have done that to, you know, some success in the storytelling of it. But I, now, I haven't read this particular, I don't recognize the, this particular story, but I would bet, I would lay odds that this door right here, this, this door with a curtain, is probably important to the story to come, if not on this page, in the next pages. So that's something that letterer has, I would bet, has taken into consideration so that they don't cover up something that they know needs to be seen so that it's dropping a visual cue for things to come. That's a lot of times folks will, will, you know, read comics and we, we get the stories, we get the, we follow it through and all that, but to stop and really think about how much is being told to you from image to image is it, it, it's wild how much, a good a good artistic team will will go through you know it's kind of like when you're watching a film and some there's some background detail that goes by in a shot while a couple of people are talking that has nothing to do with that exact moment but you want that thing lodged in the subconscious of the person seeing it so that in the next cut or the next scene or later on it's called back to and that creates you know this this continuity of storytelling across the medium you know and of course you know they, they do it in film all the time and i would argue that quite a few things that are done in film came from comics real quick uh, zoom out yeah. please now this is something uh, quite interesting that, that you know of, and the artist, even though there's a lot of noodling and a quote, a lot of detail, uh, he also pulled back when it was unnecessary. For example, the first shot with the uh, two men, Conan in the background, you see the uh, background of the establishment, which establishes that they're inside, they're in a location. And yeah. every, uh, and then the next one is the lady, they made the background dark to emphasize her so she pops more. Then they gave her a background to really give you the feeling of the tight frozen space, which is practically over Conan's shoulder or behind him. In the next two panels. Well, and there, there's also the, the, the wood element right here of the beam. Right. And then the way the, the, the beam down here Correct. sits in there. Correct. You know, these things are. Yeah. But there's no background. No background. background. But there's no background here because now it's unimportant. It can save time and it would actually clutter the page and slow down the reading. Yeah. So, and then something else. Of course, this is this is what I call a three tier page. We basically have three three uh, rows of panels, and so here, his general layout. Is running like that. It's really two, two a pair of Z's, two Z's stacked yeah. together, and with that, one of the things that I noticed looking into this is you see how it starts here. We've yes. got this guy, and yeah. then his his gaze. The next the next major shape is going to be his head. So you're brought into there. Then faces attract the eye. So boom, boom, boom. One, two, three. Then the next face that your eye notices, whether you realize it or not, is most likely that one. Yeah. And then look at the direction she's looking in. Her eye line shoots right across to where where Bashima wants you to go next. Yep. Not down here, not down here, right across to there. He's using whether he consciously did that or not. Yes. He is he is you he may he may have just done it instinctually. But he is using her eye line to create that instinctual directional across to the next piece of content he wants you to 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 latch onto. So, and then from there, you know, we have, like we said earlier, we've got the the way these things flow. Yeah. yeah. Leads us to the next next panel. Then, if you look at the uh, the overall darkness of this panel. You know, he's using the light and dark of these to guide you from face to face. And again, 
the angle of her face is turned this way and his is over here. So, you know, you see these things. It's, 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 it's just masterful. Yeah. You know, it's like all of these little nuances that, that, that they, it, it's like, uh, it's like in special effects, you know, if the special effects in a film, if you go, Oh, there's the special effects, then they were done poorly. Now, real yeah. quick, uh, if you notice with Conan, uh, sorry for jumping in. Um, if you look at Conan and the way everything else is staged with him being in the center, he's also yeah. aware of everything around him. And almost even, yeah. he's almost breaking the fourth wall, almost looking like, wait, is there something I'm not aware of? And the lady next to him, of course, is oblivious and is not fully paying attention to Conan. She brings you back into the book uh, where Conan almost breaks the fourth wall. I thought that was quite interesting to give you the strength of Conan's presence. Like, Conan's presence. I am aware of it all. Oh, but it's subconscious. That, that, uh, that panel in the center here, also with this kind of layout, reinforces he is the center of the story. Yes. I mean, I literally, quite literally, he is the center of the story. Yep. So, and that's that's an interesting thing to note as you're yep. looking at the page. Yep. So, yep. and then there's there's also the added, like, just in case, almost as if guiding you, right. you know, there's this, right. this movement right here. So, just in case your eye is tempted to go on down here, it's like, no, here's this and this, yep. and all of these things are leading you over there. So, and then, he, you know, he's, this is something I've, I've noticed John Bashima did a lot. Yeah. Is yeah. he uses the eye lines to guide the viewer frequently. Boom, boom, boom. Yes. You can see. And then yes. where do we go here? We go from here to here, reinforcing the direction she's looking in. But then there's two characters here who are both looking over here. So those eye lines are, are telling you how to read the page, mm -hmm. whether you realize it or not. And it's, it's, it's just such a, an instinctual thing about how we see and, and we recognize, you know, faces and people and so on. Uh, that, that's, that's a really interesting thing that, to note in there. And if you also see another thing to consider, like I said earlier, I think was the, uh, the, the light and darks, the, the shadows, of the page. So like I would just about bet that if we um can you play with the if game? We pump, <laughs> yes. Yeah, if yes. we if we pumped that, you know, you could you could squeeze that and you can still see how the light from here to here across, you can still analyze that and mm -hmm. see how those mm -hmm. things help you travel across the page. So it's 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 really wild sometimes to do that deep of a breakdown on a page. Um, let's go I on to another one. Mathematics behind it. Oh yes. No. So so here we've got a, a classic Bashima uh, splash page, and it's funny. Like as an artist, I'm actually not that fond of splash pages mm. because okay. I, uh, okay. I I I think they. I think they're overused in modern comics. Mm. Uh, they they got really overused in the '90s. And as much as I love my '90s comics and stuff like from the from the Image guys, I think that that they really overuse the large splash pages. Would you say splash and, pages saves time? Splash pages saves time. Yeah, I, I think quite often a splash page is uh, can be a really opportune place for an artist who's looking to do some wanking. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, that's, that's what it turns into a lot of times. Now, this is not one of those. This is, this is Bishima and Bishima is no wanker. So, <laughs> you know, here, I mean, just put it, put it out there like it is. So, you know, with this, uh, we can look at a number of different factors here in the composition of this page, which is kind of my focus right now. But obviously, the lettering's here, but if we took that lettering away, 
yeah this cloth up yeah. here creates a shape that has you know these angle of thrust that lead us down to an element here boom boom that leads us to here yeah and obviously yeah. he's looking you know he's looking here sorry i didn't mean to draw that straight to the ubies but uh but that's probably what he's looking at yeah and uh you know, and here we have all eyes, on th these eyes and these eyes, all these eyes are on her. Everyone is definitely looking at the girl dancing, except for this numb nut. I don't know what his deal is. Yeah, uh, he's he's just uh, <laughs> he's just busy blowing on his horn, and we'll just oh, leave that for what it is. We got about seven. But, uh, <laughs> you're not going to say any of them. We don't want you don't want this show to be a band mm. in in uh, Bengal. In, in, uh, Bengal. All right, I need to check and see if my uh, your camera. I think I lost my. Yeah, I lost my camera connection for a second. So, yeah, I'm gonna take just a second here to kill that and reopen my. Uh, I also my think it's about app. forty words for the single panel. Mm. Let's see here. That is not cool. It's my 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 audio is still coming through, right? Oh yeah. Oh, by the way, you know what music is being played? No. Oh Lord. Yeah, you're back. All right. Yeah, you're back. Okay, cool. Yeah, I had to reinitialize my camera hub. So, let's hop back over here. Yes. And uh. Yes. Now your camera's dead again. So there, there's, if we, did my camera die again on me? It, it keeps hmm. going to your phone. I, just, oh. ah, I dropped it. Oh, that is, that is, unfortunate. I'm allergic to the, I'm allergic to the uh, non-phone, or to the non -phone. Oh, actually, I can't do that. So let's just do that. There we go. So now we'll just go on with the voices. But, uh, oh, my God. <laughs> That's funny. So you can still hear me okay, right? Yeah. Perfect. All right. Good deal. I love how I love how. All right. I, yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of, uh, of. Of that, how uh, yeah, do not understand why my camera disconnected. God damn it. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Let's kill that. There we go. I wonder if that overlay is what's causing that. Well, while uh, while he has stepped away for a moment, come back over here and take a look at what's going on in this. So if we look at different elements here, we can see the uh, th this this guy right up here i think i probably would have chosen something a little different there because i feel like that if it weren't for the lettering this would detract from what pulls us into the rest of the page but because of the lettering we're reading we're reading and then we're in and then the letterer has really done a good job of using all this space I think this shows that Bashima knew, you know, Bashima is thinking about the space left for the lettering. And he left, if you notice, if you were to remove this, these lettering bubbles, that there's really not a whole lot going on in that area. So that really makes sense for that to be a, a place for lettering and a place where he's not having to be super concerned about the composition that much. Although there is the thrust of this cloth 
that really helps drag our eye into this main focal area here. And then her her eye line is traveling back over to this guy. The and then the overall point. thrust created right here leads us back out. And then I would just note that this, this little area here at the bottom, this little bit of, uh, of hatching and detail here, creates a, a little spot of darkness that helps reinforce the eye going across to that corner where it's going to turn the page. So that's a... kind of a, a it's a wild page to analyze like that because when you look at it also if you think about the uh, the whole uh, Charles refresh yep. my brain what is that yep. called the uh, uh, I always think of it as the uh, the spiral or the Fibonacci sequence yes it, well well it's it's the uh, golden ratio you know we have the yeah spiral of a conch shell and yeah, it's going from um, it's actually going from the guys behind in, in the opposite direction, where it's it's not clockwise; it's actually counterclockwise from from the dudes. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that like it it actually, really so works out well. Back. It works out both ways. Yeah, but uh, start from one, the dudes in the back. There's... Start from the dudes in the back. Was that? I, oh I, yeah. Left arm, the two guys who look like no, not that, that back, the other back. Down your your right side, go across downward, then up. Yeah, like that? right. Yeah. All of them work. Hmm. All of them. Work. It's well, it's, it's interesting to me that you can you know you can think about that that the golden ratio and you can apply that. Like I, I'm looking at this and I see how it applies in like five different directions. Yeah, it's it's a wild thing to. You know there there's a book out there, um, there's a book out there um, that I highly recommend and I've used when uh, I've taught people. It's called a Framed Perspective. Um, you could look at hmm. you know you could look, I forgot the name of the writer. I can look it up um, and then post it to you. But uh, that literally teaches the mathematics of how to understand it. Once you understand innately the mathematics uh, on a almost subconscious level of the geometry, then this type of uh, layout will start to come more and more naturally. Um, and it's interesting how you have a Western style of mathematics as compared to the uh, Eastern style. Um, yes, it would be a full page. It's a full page flash. So that would be original art would be 11 by 17 or even bigger. Some of the artists work at a larger scale, and then to be reduced to at the time, those books seven inches by a ten and a quarter. Now they're a set a ten and a quarter by six point one two five. Let's let's move on to another page here. This is a a, a good example of just straight up panel to panel storytelling. If we're looking at the composition, I love the panel break here. Yeah. yeah. The, the the panel break. So if we if we follow again, we're starting from here. We've got a, a line that thrusts up, and this character's spine thrusts us this way. Then that sword catches us and brings us down. I mean, we're definitely going to take a look at his face on the way through, but that sword is going to drag us on down. Now here's where, to me. And again, I know I'm critiquing John Bashima here. I probably would have had that arm reach over here and the sword come up, breaking out of this panel and breaking into this panel so that it helped reinforce going down to the next one. Because as I look at this, my eye naturally wants to go down here. But he did include this motion line and the, the sword right there that helps pick you back up and swing you around. And this is another example of that three-tier layout that he used to do a lot back then. It was very common in comics back then. So that's a... I would say that when people are doing a three-tier layout, they're, 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 they're reaching back into the late 60s, early 70s. So 
Now here, the composition almost breaks down, but the letterer comes to comes through and kind of saves the day by adding this element here that forces you to read across far enough that you catch this face and and understand that everything's here. Sure. So, you know this this right here, I would say of oh, excuse oh. me. Oh. Of the of the pages, now now this is all relative, okay? Because in my mind, there's there's no such thing as a weak John Bashima page. But of the pages we've looked at so far, this one to me is is probably the roughest in the layout department, and the composition has the composition on this page is the shakiest. You can also tell. I would bet. Or see, I would I would lay dimes to dollars that when Bashima drew this page, he was under a wild deadline crunch. Because if we look back here, you see how much he put into these backgrounds. And then if we look here, I mean, obviously there's a ton going on. But on this page, I mean, there's like just enough to give us some context. Really, at just two points. So, I'm, I'm jumping on, on this one uh, from from what I've experienced as, as a publisher. This is heavy action. Because it's heavy action, uh, it's actually logical to pull back on backgrounds and have more strong thrusting, moving. And what I really enjoy about the uh, second panel is the sword and Conan's hand break out of the frame to give you a sense that he is attacking with such brutal force, not even the frames you can gain him. Uh, then you have the yeah. No, I, I, I can I can definitely see that. Right. And um, and that's that's a, that's totally a valid point when it comes to uh, you know the the big action pages like that. It's yeah. very common. I, I will say for myself as an artist, I. I don't go that route very often. Yeah. It's it's most yeah. of the time I will I want backgrounds. I yeah. want backgrounds yeah. everywhere. I, I as an artist, I tend to try and treat my my backgrounds almost as much of a character as the characters. Right. And now, yeah. now sometimes yeah. sometimes it puts me in a pickle when it comes to some choices that I'll make. Yeah. But uh but I yeah. totally understand, you know, and and I think I think most of us as artists, you know, if you're doing this kind of art, you probably do enjoy drawing with detail and putting all those little things in there, which is, you know, that's kind of why I look at a page like this from someone as great as John Bashima. Oh yeah. And it's still an excellent page. It's, to me, this is this this reads to me like proof that a great like Bashima will still do something excellent even under what I imagine were probably some pretty terrible conditions. So I, I can't imagine that this page was not done under an insane deadline crunch. Oh, oh, I, now this guy right here, this, oh my Lord, I love this. I love this page. This is a great example of a time when, you know, he's got an opportunity to just go ham on his details, but then also his composition, too. Because here we have, there's obviously all of this weight, okay? Yes. And then the light to shadow reinforces it. If he had, like, he could have tried doing, like, little ticks and hatching and stuff instead of the solid shape shadow like that. But by doing that solid shadow, it really reinforces the weight of what's going on here. And then, of course, you know, this guy. Now, I, I wonder what happened to the hand right there. I'm Because not seeing this, down here, it looks like the character it's is gone. missing the hand. Yeah, it's missing the hand. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of interesting. Maybe instead of going uh, ham, he went steak burger. Nah. So... Here is something that I absolutely love. If we look at this area right here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we, let's draw some lines that way. And then 
look at this over here. I'll, I'll draw these lines the other way. We see these, these uh, opposing planes. And the depth in this is created. Here, he's almost done that for us. Like, we can see these different planes of, uh, like, if I choose a different color and go in here, and I highlight these, you know, yeah. so we can yeah. really get a feel for it. These different planes created by the different elements are just pulling us into and out of the image. You can really delineate all that stuff really strongly. So he's created all this depth by by these different, you know, like there's there's a big framing plane. Here's another big framing plane. So those things all frame up this guy right here in the center. And the same sort of thing is going on up here. You know, we've got great all of that of is framing. What's that? Great use of negative space. Yeah. And, and then what's interesting with that weird cave over there, when you first drew it, it was like a demonic Pac-Man rushing in. But now when I look at yeah. it, it's like a weird insect eye that's been bleeding or cut. And, and, and it, see, that's how my mind will like shift and move. And then, but I realize it's a cave. But if you separate it out, it almost looks like an insect eye. Hmm. Oh, God, I can see it now, man. Right. That's see? really wild. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, whatever you do, do not draw uh, knees on the demon figure. I mean, don't draw horns on the demon figure on his knees. No, no, he has horn knees. Oh my god, I can't believe I fell for that. <laughs> Terrible. Terrible. Okay, let's get back to real stuff. <laughs> Oh my God! So, <laughs> whoops! Awful. You can see right through, right through here. Yeah. See how he's he's chosen all of this stuff here to shut to do in deep shadows, right? Right. This is all framing. Like this this page is probably one of the better examples I've seen in a hot minute of of using the background elements. And laying out their those planes of depth and the way they intersect with each other, like this this one goes here, this one goes here. These are these right here. You could argue just follow that one, but where it all ends up is you know you've got these giant shapes that are framing for this guy. Their eyes and. Are you know, obviously, the, like, there's no mistaking that this guy is the center. Then the, the way that this little fella right here is just, whoop, he's so tiny. Yes. But you know, it's less. Yeah. Could you imagine a word balloon over the uh, monster's uh, left shoulder where that bubbling fire is and it's saying, next time, bring me spam and eggs. <sighs> Good grief. So the uh, now something else to take note of here. This is definitely this is the the monster's tail, and amidst all this rock and everything, that tail could get lost. But one of the choices that's made here that allows that tail to not get lost is these these strokes that do the shading on that are a little different. See how there's there's different kind of cross hatching. And different different techniques, they you know they've intentionally. Now I'm not sure if Bashima inked this himself, or uh, or he had somebody else inking this. But uh, whoever inked this, down. what's that? Take a look at the lower. Um, oh yeah, yeah, it could be Bob. I am not sure. For those who are using their iPhones, yeah, can you zoom in on individual panels for a moment for the uh, iPhone people? Oh yeah. There we go. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah. So that that panel, I mean, that's damn near a splash page. Oh yeah. But it's a it's a great there's so many different things this is a great example of. I mean, you have the 
I, I love these. I use this kind of stuff in my own work all the time. Is these kind of fanning strokes to create a sense of topology across, you know, elements in the background. Then uh, the the more I look at it, the more fascinated I am by the uh, the presence of this little guy. How it reinforces, like if we didn't have that little guy in there. We would have nothing to judge the size of this creature by. I mean, the cave could be arbitrary. It could be, I mean, this creature without a point of comparison there, that creature literally could be as big as a house or as small as a frog. And you would have no way to know. Here's what I find fascinating but, about, uh, sorry to jump in, about the cave element and the slop element that he's eating. Both of them are amorphous, um, globular shapes, but you get more of a solid feeling with the way the rocks are as compared to the slop the creature is eating. But they're both yeah. very similar in shape, which I find fascinating uh, on that. And I just thought of two jokes with the tail. Oh, God. It has to do with stroke. Oh, but God, no. Be on that. Um, now, one thing I'm uh, curious is, real quick, is you've had a very good stroke of good luck, and that is called Homestead. And real quick, oh there's God. just a few days left to the Homestead comic. So if you go to Kickstarter and pledge a little bit, we uh, let's make it over the twenty thousand dollar mark. Oh yeah, we're we're how many days now? I think six days left on it, and. Six uh, days. Yeah, like six days left, and I haven't checked the total this morning. But last time I checked, we were we were well on our way to uh, to twenty k. Yes. Okay. Let's get back to tail stroking. Huh? Tails. Oh, that's terrible. Let's see here. I'm just curious, real quick. Nineteen thousand three hundred. Yes. Yeah, nineteen three hundred one right now. Damn, that's great. So that's that, that's great. Yeah. So hopefully in the next six days we'll we'll cross that twenty k line. But back to uh, back to the show here, folks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That's great. Let's peel back out of that one and move on to ah. Uh, here's okay. Now this is this is a much more wide open shot of uh, Mephisto and I believe I'm going to guess that this is from the uh, I think it was a, a X Factor versus Fantastic Four oh. back in uh, about, probably about 86 ish something like that let's see oh. yeah yeah, this was this was. Uh, I might be wrong on the book, but I'm definitely right on the era. So this is another uh, another splash page. And given how hot and heavy Marvel was cranking out the books during this era, you know, I'm I'm not surprised that it's very sparse. Mm. Now that could have been a deadline choice, or could have just been, you know, could have just been his direction on it, where he wanted to go. But if we're looking at composition, we've got here, we've got some framing from the, the dark areas here. And he's kind of blocked it off into framing up Mephisto and then framing her up with these creatures here. So it's interesting to me that he's really created. It's almost like there's two worlds here. There's there's the world Mephisto sits in, and then there's the world she's in. And then by having this critter right here and these other critters, you know, it 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 creates a, that sense of, of violation and invasion coming in for her. So there's something kind of neat about that. But then also. There's your your golden mean again, or golden ratio. Boom, right there. 
but then he's also coming through here with it like that. So that's that's another thing that you can tell. That that's very frequently that's going to be found in really good composition is that that golden ratio is going to be able to be seen quite likely from multiple directions. So um, let's see what else we got here. Yeah, I think I, I had a couple more splash pages and. Uh, I know you wanted to mention a uh, a little bit about uh, inking. Um, I want to hold on to that until we do. Okay. Maybe next time we'll do a dedic do the episode dedicated on just discussing inks because uh, we're coming into we've got about eight minutes left. Okay, and uh, I'm gonna pop back over. Um, the fa the fans the fans want uh, new stroke jokes. Uh, and also, oh they're my God. and they're wondering about um, the stretch goal, the latest stretch goal, which is for twenty thousand dollars. I think you get a magical pin or something uh, on the Kickstarter. Yeah, at uh, at twenty k, I think we're right. doing these werewolf pins. Yeah, like uh, like you know, lapel pin kind of collector's pin sort of thing. Then uh, I don't know. I know there's been talk of stuff to put on on tap in the last day or two if we break 20k, but I don't know yet what it is. So, and I've been um, off. Of course, Charles has been manning the manning the shop here for me, watching the uh, the watching the folks, uh, the viewers. Yeah, and that's been yeah. super handy. Thank you for that. That's because the so viewers I'm just are taking cool. a quick look. I like the viewers. I'm taking a quick look through to see what uh, what folks are are saying over here before we have to close things out here in a couple minutes. So I've been, you know, behind the scenes over here chugging away in the uh, uh, Clip Studio. Yeah. yeah. Brent says the yeah. book is practically done in silver now. Yeah. It is. Absolutely. Yeah, I am. I am super happy about that because the. Yeah, it's funny. I feel like, uh, you yeah, know, there, there's a song from uh, from Johnny Cash and Glenn Danzig together called yeah. Come to Silver that is like, you know, it, it seems like it's going to be the theme song for Homestead now. So I'm super down with that. And if and no one knows it, go look it up. Yeah. Uh, both versions are awesome. Johnny Cash is great. And the and Glenn Danzig's version is awesome. It's actually one of a handful of songs that Danzig wrote for Johnny upon meeting him. The the story goes that uh, Danzig was doing sessions with uh, with Rick Rubin, and he shows up at the studio, and Rick Rubin has Johnny Cash there because he's working with him too. And Danzig is like, "Dude, that's Johnny Cash." I'm going to pull you off the stage. Woo. Oh, real and, cool. uh, oh yeah, man. Danzig dude. Danzig. I love me some Danzig, but yeah, apparently Danzig showed up and was all kind of like, you know, starstruck and Rick Ribbon's like, you like, oh, you like Johnny Cash. And you know, Danzig is like, of course I like Johnny Cash. I mean, who doesn't love Johnny Cash? And he's like, I mean, the, the way the story goes that I've heard it, you know, God knows I wasn't there, but, uh, you know, that basically Rick Rubin is like, you want to write a couple songs with it? And it's like, dude, when somebody asks you to sit down and write a song with Johnny Cash and Johnny is there and, and in for it, <laughs> of course. I mean, it's like Johnny Cash doing Hurt from Nine Inch Nails. I'm, I'm like, I'm sorry, Trent. It's not your song anymore. No. It's not your song anymore. When no. Johnny takes your song, you say, yes, sir, and thank you. Ah. So oh, that's, that's how that game works. Plus. Yeah, with what you just did earlier, you know, showing everything and with a tail, I would have to say it's a stroke of genius. Oh my god, the stroke jokes! Oh my god, yes, as long as it's not a long uh, stroke, not a long stroke. backstroke, man. Uh, what is da zing? I'm, I'm gonna start calling this the groan cast. Yeah, what is dancing? Oh, you don't know Danzig. 
Oh my god! Is it like a song like oh my god. by myself? Oh, oh, oh. Sometimes you literally make my soul hurt. Uh, <laughs> just, just, just go type that in somewhere and go listen to the man's work. Okay. Glenn Danzig, founder okay. of the Misfits, founder of Samhain, long solo career, excellence for decades. I think the man's only ever done one album that I don't like. Oh, and wow. even it has great songs on it, just the production's terrible. Yeah. So, yeah, in, in, anybody who's a Danzig fan, we all kind of we all kind of cough when we say Black Acid Devil. That 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 uh, there's there's the album Danzig Five. He numbered all of his solo albums. So Danzig Five, Black Acid Devil. He kind of went diving into uh, uh, trying to dive into industrial music. Industrial. And the songs are great when you hear them live. Yes. And it's just a band with him playing, but but that album, yeah, not so good. Oh man! So, could, all right. Could you imagine listening to music dead? You get an atomic battery onto a uh, repeating MP3 player, and you just have it buried with you. So the next uh, like fifty thousand years, you can play the music. You think of some weird shit, dude. By the way, thank you. Oh uh, yeah, everyone. Punch cast says Christopher Kane. Plunge Twist of Cain is an amazing song. Yeah, the, the, Dan, Danzig has been almost a soundtrack for my life from about age 16 forward. So that's a long time to be listening to Danzig. Ah, uh, well, thank you folks for hanging out. Uh, I do believe that's going to wrap us up for today. By the way, thank Let's you. See. You all were a blast. And uh, without you, uh, this show would not be as fun. So uh, thank you for listening and, and watching and uh, also learning because uh, the one advantage of Les is he is a uh, virtuoso genius and a renaissance dude of the modern age. This guy says this stuff and I'm just like, eh. Yeah, we know. People are going to think I'm paying him to say this shit. Oh, my God. All right, Charles. With that, you're off the stage. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Charles. Oh, my God. All right, folks. Well, thank you very much for hanging out as we go diving into uh, kind of the nuts and bolts of comics and comic art. Uh, that's really the nature of what this show is supposed to be. Now, sometimes I may be doing some drawing. Sometimes we may have other artists come on and hang out and, uh, and, and do you know different things like sketching together, doing some jam art, breaking down art together. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff. So, you know, that's uh, that's what it's all about. And I hope that uh, in the course of the show, maybe we can uh, all learn a little bit more together about comics and, and just love these damn things a little bit more. So thank you, folks. And until next week, I'm out. Peace. Glamorized and embraced by Hollywood, feared in the underworld. Benjamin Bugsy Siegel was one of the most powerful men in America. He was also one of the most hated. The man who gave birth to Las Vegas was gunned down in the luxurious home of his glamorous lover. Almost 80 years later, his murder remains unsolved. Who killed Bugsy? City Magazine is just really pulling out all the stops, man. Your guys' production value of this of this magazine has gone insane. I mean, look at the. I mean, I remember when you guys it was black and white. Even when it was black and white, I thought your quality was great. But damn, they have just. I mean, they just really stepping it up and on. Look at this. James Corbett, boys. James Corbett, genuinely cutting, um, but also funny and obviously just. 
chaotic and, and very fun. I love Flip City. It has brought new types of badassery and integrity to the print medium.